Don't you hate it when someone tells you that you just need more willpower? Hey everybody, this is Mike Erlob with another episode of Power Your Life by Flex PT. So I want to talk a little bit about that uh, today. Um, you know, <clears throat> don't you just hate it? Don't you just hate that when you're we're trying to do something with your life? Um, for some people, it's you know you're trying to you're trying to lose weight. For other people, maybe you're trying to start an exercise program just to be healthy. Uh, maybe you're trying to change how you eat. Maybe you're you know you're trying to change something in your life to improve yourself and. You know, you sometimes fall off the wagon. Um, you know, I've done that. Sometimes you just, you just, you, you know, you have trouble staying on course. And, you know, you go to talk to a friend, you talk to somebody, and you just, you know, you say, gosh, I, I can't, I just can't seem to figure this out. You know, why can't I, and you can fill in the blank, whatever it is you're doing. And, you know, that friend of yours looks at you, or your family member, or somebody, and says, you know what you need? You know what your problem is? You just need more willpower. And you sit back and you're like, wait a minute here. Now, now, you know, that that is it, it's it's it really kind of gets under my skin a little bit, right? Because what is willpower, really? You know, and and how, how do you get more willpower? Really? What do you <laughs> what do we do? Do we just like pull this out of the air and say, hey, I'm gonna have more willpower today? You know, and it's it's not like it's not like any one of us wake up in the morning. And we say, hey, you know what? I'm going to just ruin my diet today. Uh, none of us wake up and we say, you know what? I think I'm just not going to exercise. You know, well, maybe you do if you're taking the day off. But, you know, we all have these intentions. And they're well-meaning good intentions. You know, and it's, it, it, it's even this way when, <clears throat> you know, if we want to talk about New Year's resolutions. You know, most, what is it? I think like 80% of the New Year's resolutions before the end of the month People, they're, they're out the window. They've already failed at it. And, you know, people say, well, you just need more willpower. And you know what? You just want to take them and you just want to slap them <laughs> because it's, it's, it's more than that. And it's not just about willpower. But <clears throat> to me, willpower is, is related to it's a mindset. OK, and, you know, it's a mindset and I like to think of it not as willpower because willpower is fleeting. You know, that's saying that you can will yourself to do something. And I don't believe that's always true because there's times where things are going to happen in your life that you're going to, you know, going to take over and, and, and your well-meaning, you know, good intentions, you're just not going to be successful with them. So instead of talking about willpower, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the time and I want to talk about what I call mental toughness. And, you know, this is, you know, it, again, you know, somebody could say, well, you just need more mental toughness. Well, you know, mental toughness is something that I have experienced. Uh, I've seen it. I've experienced it personally in different things that I've done. I know that it's a real thing. And I know that's actually more than just saying willpower. And, and willpower is hard to define. But mental toughness is not. And it's something that uh, it's really near and dear to me. And I'm like super, super excited. I can't even tell you. I'm super excited to be able to share this information with you guys because and share my own experiences with, you know, what is mental toughness? You know, how do you get it? What do you, how do you develop it? Uh, how do you improve upon it? You know, what does that mean for you even? So, you know, let's, let's, let's delve into that a little bit more. You know, in my opinion, mental toughness is basically, it's one of the key ingredients that you need to be successful in any endeavor that you're going to be doing, um, especially if it involves a lot of change. Because let's face it, um, we're creatures of habit, okay? We're humans. We don't like change. Most of us don't. You know, if we had our druthers, we would like everything in a neat little box and we'd like it just to stay the same. Well, I got news for you guys. That's not how things work. And if that is the way you are thinking, then you're really going to be set up for a lifetime of disappointment because things change and you've got to have a mindset, a mental toughness that can ebb and flow with that change. So this is true in anything that you're doing. This is true in, in a weight loss 
Um, this is true in a business. This is true in your life, uh, workout program, you name it. This is something that you can apply to any, any facet of your life. So to me, the true definition of mental toughness is the ability to push on no matter what. Because, you know, life's going to get in the way and life's going to get in the way of your success. And it is your ability, the first, one of the first and foremost important aspects of this. And I want to talk a little bit deeper into it. Um, you know, I'm, this is, I'm so passionate about this subject because I've really spent a lot of time in the last six months really delving into it and so doing some introspective, you know, uh, look into myself and to find out how I can, you know, become more mentally uh, tough. But it, it's your ability to be connected to a greater purpose or power. Um, and that is one of the key ingredients to developing that. So basically when things go wrong, that's going to be your ability to push on mentally no matter what. You see, that is mental toughness, not willpower. That's mental toughness. And the most successful people in any aspect of their lives, they have this ability. And the thing I want you to know is each and every one of us has that within us. Okay? You have that mental toughness. It's a matter of finding it, harnessing it, learning how to use that, and then driving on through what you need to do. So one of the key points that I've learned with this, and I've just learned this in, in my experiences. In fact, I was talking with a friend of mine uh, just a little bit of about an hour and a half ago about this. Um, and on, we were discussing some, you know, some different business tips and you know, one of the things I, I told him, I said, hey, you know what? I said, this is awesome because what you're doing is you're making me go outside of my comfort zone. And I'm going to have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And that's one of the quotes that I just love. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but that's behind me. We have our life changer graphic, which is our manifesto of what we believe here. And that's one of them on there is that I get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And it is very, it's very true. You have to do that. Um, the other aspect to the mental toughness that I love, I just love, it's a quote really. And it just says, you know, that what it is, is it helps you find the fuel when your tank is empty. Because, you know, we're all going to have those days. You know, I have them all the time. Now, I wake up in the morning and sometimes going to work, it's the last thing you want to do. You know, sometimes um, working out is the last thing you want to do, you know, whether you do it in the morning or at the end of the day. You know, we all have those, those tasks and those things in our lives that sometimes you just, you know, your tank is empty. You're spent. You can't do anything more. And somehow you have to reach deep inside and find that, um, you know, and I've experienced this on my own. When, when I was in, when I was in high school, um, I was a wrestler and wrestling was a sport that I just, it was near and dear to me. And I just, I just loved it. Now, the thing about, the thing about wrestling was, um, I did not start like the typical wrestling kid does. Um, my dad, he was a baseball player and basketball coach. He knew nothing about wrestling. So he really, you know, steered me towards those two sports, which I was terrible. I sucked at them. I was, I was just really bad. And I decided in the eighth grade, have never wrestled in my life that, hey, you know what? I want to go out for wrestling. And, you know, I go, went up against kids that had been doing it since they were like in kindergarten. So I got I got beat up pretty good. I got my face was just ran all over the mat. And I think that first year I won maybe one match. And, but I really liked it, you know? And so I, I might, that was eighth grade, ninth grade year. I moved up to high school and I went out for wrestling again. And I think that year I won maybe two or three matches on the freshman team. And then I just kept with it. And next thing you know, by the time I'm a sophomore, I think I won. 12 or 13 matches by my junior year, I'm maybe up to about 20 matches. So I'm, I'm really getting a lot better. By the time I was a junior, I was actually starting to wrestle on some varsity slots. You know, I'd earned my way on the team. I was really, you know, coming into my own. And 
it gave me a sense of purpose of who I was. And that's really, that's who my identity was at that time. But then what happened is you get ready for your senior year and you know, everything is culminating. You're all, you're, you're just so excited. This is going to be the year that you have the breakout, you know, where, where you just are, are do amazingly well. And I did play football and I had an injury, season injury, season ending injury, um, second game of the football season. And I tore some cartilage in my left knee, had to have surgery, had some ligament damage, football was over. Um, it really put wrestling in jeopardy, um, but I made it back. You know, I went through rehab, I stuck with it. And first practice back, this was right before Thanksgiving, uh, my senior year, first practice back, um, it was the first maybe 10 minutes in the warm up. I got my right knee twisted, folded underneath me, and I tore the meniscus and ligaments in my right knee. And you talk about just wanting to give up. I mean, I wanted to cash in my chips, I was done. You know, I just had surgery on the left one, now I had to have surgery on the right. Um, you know, I had to dig in and really ask myself a lot of questions about what it is I wanted to do and did I want to continue with this sport? And I, I wanted to, I wanted to more than anything. So. You know, I went through the rehab, I dug in, I did what I had to do. I earned my spot back out on the team. I didn't make it back until the second half after Christmas, but I, I earned my way back and got that varsity spot and I qualified for the state tournament. Now, I did not, I didn't place, but for me, where I had come from, from this, this eighth grader that maybe weighed 112 pounds soaking wet, that could only win one match, um, and that was against another kid who'd never wrestled in his life either to, you know, a kid who went through some adversity his senior year, overcame that and actually earned his way to the state tournament, even though he doesn't place to me, you know, that was success. And had I not had a very strong purpose of what it is I wanted to do, I would have quit. Um, you know, and so that forced me to develop some mental toughness. Um, I've seen this, you know, throughout my career. Um, I was, a lot of you know that I was active duty Army. I was a medic with the 4th Squadron, 7th U.S. Cavalry, and we were the reconnaissance for the 3rd Armored Division. And we, I served in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm in, you know, 90 and 91. And uh, we had a uh, command sergeant major, his name was uh, Ronald Sneed. And uh, I, you know, in my unit, I was very fortunate to have a lot of really awesome, great leaders. And he was one of them. Uh, Command Sergeant Major Ronald Sneed was an amazing, amazing non-commissioned officer. Um, he knew how to lead and lead by example. And if you want to talk about somebody that you would say they are mentally tough, this was the guy. I mean, if you had mental toughness and you put it in the dictionary, it would have a picture of Command Sergeant Major Ronald Sneed. Um, you know, he, he would get us to where we would follow him to hell and back. And, you know, he was a Vietnam veteran. He had done two tours in, in Nam. He had been wounded multiple times. You know, he went through hell and back. And he could have he quit, but he had a calling. He knew that serving in the military and his experiences, he could teach the younger soldiers on what they should do. And that by him doing that, he could actually save their lives. Um, and you know, he had a strong sense of being a patriot and serving his country. And you know, those things developed his mental toughness. So, you know, those are all, that's how I know that this is a subject that is, is very, very important. One of the other things that I know is that with mental toughness, is, is it's something that you build over time. You know, we do have it within us but you have to develop it. It's a skill. You know, it's like a muscle that must be exercised. The more you, the more you work with it, the better you get at it. And I don't want to just sit here and, and preach to you about mental toughness without giving you some steps and giving you some, you know, real life uh, examples of what I have done personally, which has really helped me to develop that mental toughness. 
And the first step that I know that you, you have to do is you have to have a strong purpose, okay? You've got to have a strong why behind whatever it is you're going to do. And it's going to be different for everyone and it's personal. Now, if you decide that you want to lose weight, if you want to start working out, if you want to, however you want to change your life, um, you've got to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Okay? And it can't just be, you know, when I first started to lose weight, it was not about, well, I just want to fit in a smaller size pants, you know? It wasn't that, oh, I just want to look great. It had to, it was a lot deeper than that. You know, it, I, was, I knew I was unhealthy. I knew I was going in the wrong direction. I knew my blood pressure was getting up there. You know, I looked at a picture one day with me, <clears throat> my son and daughter in the swimming pool at the summer and I just thought, oh my gosh, I, I cannot do this anymore. I have to make a change. And for me, that purpose or that why was for my family because I wanted to be there when they get older and I did not want to die an early death. Um, so, you know, that, that purpose, that connection is what will drive you and keep you going. You know, the next thing as part of that is you have to believe in yourself. You know, you have to attain belief in the fact that you can actually do this. And the, one of the ways that I did that is I call it taking stock. You know, you've got to take stock in your life and you've got to take stock in you as a person. So what I mean by that is, you know, what you have to do is you've got to start asking yourself those hard questions. You've got to start to say, okay, who am I today? Like, where am I at? But where do I want to go? Okay. And you need to write that down. You know, where am I at? What, who am I? What is going on? And then the next set is where do I want to be? And once you do that and you put it on paper, is you can actually accept the truth of who you are. Now that, there's nothing wrong with that because who you are today is not where you wanna be. You know, that's, that's on the other side. So the next thing you've gotta do once you accept the truth is you have to tell the truth. You've gotta find somebody. You need to find a friend, a family member, somebody close, and you've gotta tell them about it. You've gotta tell them, hey, this is, I'm taking stock in my life and this is where I see my life at and this is where I want it to be. The next thing you have to do is you have to breathe the truth. And so what I mean by that is we all like to think that um, all of our actions in our lives are always correct. <laughs> Let's face it, we know that they're not, you know. When you look at yourself and you look at yourself in an honest lens, don't judge yourself. Okay, it's okay. You know, look at it as if you were talking to a really good friend. You see, if your friend came to you and said, hey, you know what, this is where I see myself, um, you're not gonna tell your friend, well, it's your fault, you're there, and you didn't do X, Y, and Z, and you just need to have more willpower. You know, that's not what you're gonna do. What would you say to your friend? You'd say, you know what, bud, it's okay, because it's not your fault, all right? It's not your fault. You know where you're at today. Now let's work on changing it. And it's really important not to judge yourself. That self-judgment creates a negative loop within your brain that helps to reinforce some of those negative behaviors that have gotten you there in the first place. The next thing you've got to do is you've got then once you have, you, you kind of got a good direction where you're going, you've got to be able to create a plan based on the truth. And see, to me, this is where the fun is because this is where it, the sky's the limit. You know, all you do is just write down on paper and create the steps that you see that you need to achieve in order to get where it is that you want to be. So step number two to developing your mental toughness is <clears throat> you must have a clear vision, okay? We all have to know where it is we're going. So you've got to be connected. You've got to connect your purpose to your personal or and or professional goals. You know, write them down. And that's, that's what I did. You know, I sat down, I would write them, where do I want to be one year, three years, five years? You know, you can set it up any way. There's no right or wrong answer here. You just write them down. But you've got to make sure that your goals are connected to your purpose, okay? So your purpose or your why needs to be very personal and very strong. And when you connect your goals to that, 
what you've done now is you have created a clear vision. That is the vision uh, for what it is that you want. The third thing, or step three, that is critical, now, and I've learned this the hard way many times, you must have the power to reframe. And things, the reason I say that is because your life and, and the, the journey that you're on to achieve what it is, whether it's weight loss or working out or, um, you know, paying down your debt or whatever it is, they're not going to go the way you want them to go. It's not a linear straight line. It's, it's, it's a roundabout journey to get there. And bad things are going to happen to good people. Here is the key. When you are faced with adversity, you reframe your negative response and choose a positive solution that will keep you on track. Okay? Those who are successful can reframe any situation and focus on the positive in that situation. I want to use a personal example for that. Um, you know, and I want you to think about this too. Think about a time where you know, you've had something bad happen to you. Okay? and you, you reacted to it, and you reacted to it in a negative way, and you ended up making the situation 10 times worse. You know, we all do that. You know, we are our own worst enemy at times. And, you know, if you think about whatever that was, um, how could you have done that differently? What would have happened, imagine if you, instead of focusing on the negative of what was going on, you looked at it and you found something positive and focused on that instead. One of the personal examples is my dad. <clears throat> so my dad, my dad passed away four years ago um, from pancreatic cancer. And uh, he was a teacher. He taught uh, eighth grade health education for 33 years. And, um, you know, he, he loved to educate. Um, it, you know, growing up with my dad, growing up with a health education teacher was not always easy. Um, but the one thing about my dad is no matter what was going on in his life, um, he always had a smile and he, he, he never judged anybody. And he always knew that he, he always was always teaching. He was always trying to educate, you know, for me, he would, he would always ask, when I asked him a question, he would always answer it with a question, you know, um, and it would always get me to thinking, well, you know, I still remember the day that he called me up and he told me that he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And, you know, from the time he made that call, he lived six months and before he passed on. But my dad could have, he could have, you know, really gone negative with it. You know, he could have just given up hope. He could have just, you know, cut everybody off. He could have gotten angry. He could have, he didn't do any of those things. Um, even when my dad was sick, even when he was going through chemo, even when he was trying to fight, he always had a smile on his face. And I, I know that he felt that his job was not done. You know, he always was teaching and I know that his job to, he, he, he felt that his job was to show me, my brother and sister, how to exit this life with courage and grace, no matter what he was facing. And, you know, like I said, he could have gotten angry. He could have gotten mad, but he didn't do that. Um, you know, I still remember the very last time that I saw him and he was, he could barely, you know, walk across the grocery store. I mean, that, that just wore him out. I mean, he was getting sicker and sicker and we knew, you know, the, the end was coming very near. And, you know, he never felt sorry for himself. He never blamed anybody. He never, he just said, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm 71 years old. I've lived a good life. And I have taught my kids how to be self-sufficient and the things they need to do to take care of themselves. But there's one last, one last lesson that I've got to teach them. And I've got to teach them how to maintain their dignity, maintain their grace, and stay strong, and not blame anybody for anything, you know. And, and if I can teach them that and show them that by example, you know, I think he felt that, you know, he, he served his purpose. And for me, watching that, my dad reframed his diagnosis, and he used it to teach me about life. You see, that, that, uh, that's the greatest gift that he could have ever given me. And, you know, he did it just at the very end of his life. But that's the power to reframe. 
And so if he can do that with a di terminal diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, then I know that I can reframe anything, any situation, and always find the positives so I can keep myself moving and keep myself on track. It's not easy, but it, it, it's something that is very important in developing that mental muscle, that mental toughness side of it. You know, the next step is, who are you, okay? You, you need to know who you are. And, you know, it's very interesting because, um, you know, most of us don't know that, you know? So you have to ask yourself that question, who do I want to be, all right? And the way you should answer that is you should write that out with what, who you want to be like, like what you want to be, and like it has already happened. Now this is really important because one of the studies, there was a study that came out, and this is why this is important. Um, several years ago, there was a study that came out about de uh, depression and smiling. And what they did, the researchers took these groups of people who were all clinically depressed, and they took those who, you know, who were clinically depressed and they put them on uh, antidepressants. There was a placebo group that took a sugar pill, and there was another group that uh, was supposed to smile in front of a mirror for 10 minutes every day. And they did this, and that was their only treatment. And they did this for a period of time. And then they came back and they remeasured everybody's depression levels. And guess what? The group that had to stand in front of the mirror and smile for 10 minutes every day actually showed improvement in less uh, depression than the other groups. So what those researchers, what they, you know, what they came up with from that, um, from that research was that the brain does not know the difference based on what it sees. You know, that the people knew they were depressed, but what the brain was seeing through the eyes was the person smiling. So the brain connected and said, well, if they're smiling, we must be happy. You see, your brain does not know the difference. Um, you know, a good example of the I, you know, I am, you know, I am, you fill in the blank, is Muhammad Ali. You know, what did Muhammad Ali say all the time? When he was Cassius Clay, before he became Muhammad Ali, what did he proclaim? He said, I am the greatest. I mean, and he said it with so much emphasis and so much conviction, you know, and he would say it again and again. You know, I love watching those old, you know, the old boxing matches. I like watching the old interviews with him because he was so passionate about that. I mean, he was bound to determine, I am the greatest. And he would do that again and again. Well, I mean, he did that. He was reprogramming his brain to really believe that. And when you believe that, you're going to take the steps. Subconsciously, you're going to take those steps in that direction to be successful. You know, and it's an amazing phenomenon. So um, you have to do that. You know, write down, who are you? I call it the I am statement. I am, fill in the blank. And write a bunch of them and fill that out. The next thing I know, and, and this is, again, this is something that I've done that's been extremely helpful, is you've got to create a routine for each day, all right? This is very, very important. The routine, what it'll do is it will force you into the habits which you need, and those will be the discipline that you need to keep moving forward. So one of the things that I've done is I always take three areas, like three areas of my life. You know, I look at like a personal area, uh, either a business or an athletic uh, area, or and then service to others. You know, I take those three. And then I come up with uh, one activity in each of those that I want to do no matter what. Like I'm going to do those every single day. And I make sure that I complete those tasks every single day. And that's part of my routine. And I follow this routine every single day. The last thing, step number six, is your legacy, okay? So what is your legacy? I call this the blueprint for, for success, blueprint for your mental toughness. And basically all you're doing is you're taking everything I just talked about and you're putting it together into one statement. You, you, you have your purpose, your vision, your daily routine, and the I am or who are you statements. Write them out, and that's, I wrote them out, I put them together, study this, and then commit it to memory, and read it several times a day. You've got to reprogram yourself. You know, that's the key to your fuel when the tank is empty. You see, the one thing I do know is you either create the life that you want, or someone else will create it for you. And most likely, if it's created for you, it's not going to be the life you want. You only get one life. It's your choice. 
You know, how you live it and how you spend this time that we have been given here on earth is up to you. you. See, and that's where the mental toughness will come into play. I wanted to give you three tips, you know, three tips for growing your mental toughness muscle, for developing that muscle. And, you know, the first tip is, you know, you've got to, again, I kind of talked in this a little bit ago, but you've got to start building habits, okay? You know, you have to have a schedule. That schedule, you got to be persistent with it because with that schedule, you're going to develop habits every single day. You see, what happens is when you decide that you want to do something, um, say, let's you take weight loss, for example, and at first, in those, or even going to the gym, you know, you're going to go to the gym and work out. Well, at first, you guys know how it is. You, you, you know, you make a decision. And once you make that decision in, up here, all of a sudden, these chemicals, I mean, you feel great, right? Well, you know, you got serotonin, dopamine, and all these other neurotransmitters that are just going off and they're making you feel great. And that's the motivation. And guess what? How long does that motivation last for? What happens with New Year's resolutions? It's like a couple weeks, right? So you really have a couple weeks, a window to start building a schedule and developing these habits. You see, the schedule develops the habits, and then these little habits will start to become second nature to you. Okay, these are things like getting up early to work out, um, putting your meals together for the next day, the night before. So create these habits while you're in that motivated state. Use that two-week window, you know, to create that. Now, what will happen is these habits will help you to push past the times when you, when you hit demotivation, you know, where you just say, I'm done, I don't want to do it, okay? And every time that you find a way to tap into your personal purpose and your why and to push yourself past through the habits that you've created, you have now become a little more mentally tough. You see, I, it, it's my, my high school football coach, he told us every time, he goes, you guys, he goes, football is a game of inches. And you know what? Life is a game of inches. You see, it's a little bit at a time. You know, it's the old saying, of, you know, how do you move a mountain? You know, when you first look at it, it may seem insurmountable and you're looking up. But what you do is you keep your head down and you move one rock at a time, one rock at a time, one rock at a time. And the next thing you know, You've, you've moved through it. You've moved, you've moved through the mountain. You see? And that leads me to my second tip. Just keep moving. All right? One of the things I want you to think about is think about the first 10 minutes of your day. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, the first 10 minutes of my day is like one of the best times because everything's fresh. You're just waking up and the day is an empty slate. Anything is possible. You know, the possibilities are endless. And then life happens. Okay? But those first 10 minutes are, are, are tranquil and they're amazing. Now, let's think about this. You know, what happens to you when your alarm goes off? You know, now a lot of us, so we roll over, we hit the snooze, and we go right back to sleep. Okay? Well, what if when that alarm goes off, instead of hitting the snooze button, you just get yourself up out of bed and you take that first step, okay? Guess what you've done? You have just built a, that mental toughness muscle. You've just exercised that a little bit. You just keep moving. Now, that brings me, the other thing I wanna talk about is, is the third tip. And that is, if you just keep moving, you just keep starting, okay? Because we talked, I talked a little bit about self-judgment. Listen, you're going to make mistakes, okay? I make them all the time. All of us do. <clears throat> you're going to fall off the wagon with whatever it is you're doing. You know, if you're losing weight, you're going to get off track. If you're trying to pay debt down because your credit card bills have gotten too high, you know, you're going to have times where you end up using that credit card too much and you go on a shopping, you know, <clears throat> shopping binge. I mean, those things happen. We all fail and we all make error. That's just who we are. We're humans. We're imperfect. But, you know, <clears throat> when that happens, you, you know, you, you're going to want to give up. You're going to want to just say, you know, I, I can't do this. It's not worth it. You know, but that's exactly when you need to start again. Okay? You just keep starting because 
when you pick yourself up and you get started again and you get yourself on track, you're building that mental toughness muscle. You see, starting over is part of the journey, okay? And in the journey, that's what we're striving after. It's not always the end result, but it's what we learn in the process and the pathway of us getting there. So, you know, if you lose your momentum, you never really, you never lost your ability to be mentally tough. I know that little voice in the head is saying, oh, just quit, you can give up, it isn't, it isn't worth it. But ask yourself this question, if it was a life or death situation, you would find a way. You know, you would find that mental toughness because we are all pre-programmed to survive. Okay, that's one of our most basic instincts is survival. And if you can come up with a mental toughness to survive, I mean, you, in, that, in those situations, you can do it at any time. You just have to find it. And the key is to keep doing and keep moving. Um, you know, one of the other, a lot of people will think that, you know, stuff that I'm talking about is, you know, motivation, right? And there's a, there's a movement out there where people will say, you know, well, motivation is crap. Well, I'm going to tell you, I mean, I've personally used motivation many times in my life. And, you know, although motivation alone doesn't get you there, it can definitely be a spark that can help you get moving forward. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I, I, I was a wrestler and I had the luck. I was fortunate enough to have the most amazing wrestling coach, um, a man that taught me probably one of the most influential uh, people in my life, and it was Coach Howard Sheely. And, you know, he was my high school wrestling coach, and he was a genius at motivation. And I don't think he really knew what he was, <clears throat> what he was doing uh, at the time as far as motivation. He just knew what worked. And he was good at, at motivating us both internally and externally. You see, when you're not motivated, you're going to have to rely on those habits that you've created. And one of the things that, that Coach Sheely did for us so well was, you know, internal motivation. And he did that by getting us at the beginning of the season to tell everybody, our whole team, what our goals were, okay? How many wins you wanted to have, how many takedowns you wanted to have at each match, how many pins. I mean, he broke it down and we set those up and we had to tell everybody on the team, in a big group, and you know what that did for us is once you verbalized it and we verbalized it to the group, they, that group, the other members of the team helped check my internal motivation because I had to live up to it. And not only did I have to live up to them, I had to live up to my coach. And you know, that, <coughs> that did not, you didn't want to let them down. You know, if you did not perform at your best and you know, it was okay if you lost. That was okay, as long as you did your best, you know, but if you didn't give it your all and you walked off that, you know, not only were you disappointed with yourself, but you just, you couldn't even look coach in the eye because you felt you were letting him down, you know, and that, that is all about the external environment too that you're surrounded with. You have to create an environment for success. Your environment is extremely motivating. You have to surround yourself with other like-minded individuals because they're going to help you pull through when things get really tough. You see, that motivation, it can be a spark. And it's the spark that builds your habits, which builds your discipline, all based around a clear vision of what you want. Think of it, you know, I like to think of it like a campfire. That motivation can be the spark or the gasoline that has the potential to start a fire. See, but it's got to get poured. You got to pour that gasoline on the wood. All right. It's not going to be any good if you just pour it on the ground and you light it and there's nothing for it to burn. Sure. It'll flame and then boom, it'll go out. So the habits, the discipline and the purpose, that's the wood. Okay. The motivation is the spark. And once you light it, you know, it will take off and then it'll take over if you have those other pieces in place. And you can, harness motiv you can harness motivation to bring that spark, to bring your spark back too. And one of the ways that I've done this, and I, I actually did it just over the weekend, is I like movies. I love movies. I love stories. And <clears throat> I know it is corny, but the movie Rudy gets me every single time. 
if I'm feeling down, if I'm feeling like I can't accomplish something, I watch that movie. And you guys, I think most most everybody's probably seen that. You know, it's a story, you know, true story, um, you know, about this kid who comes from Juliet, Illinois and doesn't have anything. It's a blue collar and he wants to play for Notre Dame. And everybody laughs at him because he's too small. He's too slow. He's too weak. Everybody told him his entire life why he couldn't do something. You know, and he started to believe that and he started to fall into that. And, you know, he actually graduated high school and started working at a steel mill until his until his best friend was killed in an accident. And that was the spark he needed to say, you know what, life's too short. I'm not accepting this life that, that everybody says I have to have. I'm going out there, I'm gonna create my own life. I'm gonna follow my dreams and I'm gonna play for Notre Dame. And even though everything was stacked up against him and he didn't have the resources and he didn't have the ability, he actually had to enroll at a community college because his grades were not very good, but he kept at it because he had that strong sense of purpose or why what he wanted to accomplish. And, you know, I watch that movie and it just motivates me every single time. I get, I get chills right now just thinking about it. Um, I just love that story. So, you know, I, I really hope that, you know, these things can, can help you. Um, that's why I'm, I'm giving this to you because this is so important. I'm so passionate. It's, I, want to, I want it to help you. And I hope you can bear with me because I'm going to go just a little bit longer. This is probably a lot longer of a, of a Facebook Live than I normally do. But it's, it's really, you guys, it's that important. You know, one of the other areas that you really need to pay attention to if you want to develop that mental toughness muscle is you need to have really good internal and external awareness, okay? So what I mean by internal awareness is you guys, you, you know when something's going on with you internally um, and you realize it, you know, you know you're stressed or you know you're happy or, you know, you're like, hmm, you know, I haven't eaten for a while. I'm getting really angry. Maybe I'm getting low blood sugar. Oh, I'm hangry. Okay, maybe, and maybe, of course, don't want to eat a Snickers bar, but maybe I should get a little something to eat to get my blood sugar up. Okay, you realize what's going on with your body because you're in tune with it. And then you understand how you feel and you can take action to fix it instead of just taking it out on everybody else. You know, and you can do things that are constructive, you know, like meditation or relaxation. But that can have uh, such an impact on your ability to exercise a mental toughness muscle. One of the others is the external awareness. And that's when you have the ability to see what's going on around you. Okay, you know your environment. And then you, you, you understand how can you adjust what you are doing in response to the external factors that are around you. So, you know, I like to think of this as having the resolve to make changes that you need in order to move forward is the key. You know, you've gotta be really good about observing yourself, the people around you, you know, and your surroundings, and then taking action when you see what's going on is not serving you. And it may mean you have to make some tough decisions, you know, it might mean that you have to change those who you're hanging out with. And you might have to change where you hang out. You might have to change the activities that you're engaging in. But, you know, if those things, if those people in that environment, if they're just bringing you down, if they're just, you know, having a negative influence and they're undermining you at every corner, they're not serving you. They're not helping you. Um, and actually, they're really not your friends because friends should build each other up and they should be supportive. So, but it takes mental toughness to make those changes and to let go of what is not serving you. You see, this is the key. You know, mental toughness is the key to anyone's success. I and, mean, you know, if we look at history, it, it proves that to us. You know, one of the most, I feel it's one of the most determining factors in, in the success. I mean, it has been for me, my ability to, to learn from this and to plan it and to put things in, in place um, has been critical. And I've seen it in other aspects of my life. But, you know, we can look at it in history too. You know, you look at someone like Nelson Mandela. Um, God, that, that man must have had the, the strongest mental toughness muscle of anyone alive. Uh, Michael Jordan, um, you know, uh, 
it was not always easy for him. Uh, Jerry Rice, um, an you know, incredible football player, went through some adversity with knee injury uh, towards the end of his career. Um, one of politically, I like to uh, think of, and I'm not, you know, not trying to take one political side or the other, but um, you have to admire what happened with uh, with FDR, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You know, you 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 take you become a president in the Great Depression. And then you end up, you know, getting the, the country gets through that. And then you enter the, the, the Second World War. I, I mean, boy, you want to talk about having to have the resolve and the, you know, the why behind what it is you're doing and to be mentally tough to make those hard decisions. Um, he had to do it. And on top of that, he had polio. You know, he could not walk. Um, and, you know, he did not make excuses or let that stop him. So you, things in your life, I want to leave you with this. Um, things in your life will change. Okay, that's inevitable. There's going to be struggles ahead, all right? But those who are mentally tough with high self-esteem, those who know that they can handle anything that life throws at them, they're going to be the ones still standing. And, and that is never true, is it more true than it is today with everything that we're facing that's going on. And the more mentally tough you can make yourself now, the more it will pay off down the road. And so it's not about willpower, because I do, I hate it when people say that. It is about developing that mental toughness muscle. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to give you a framework that you can take and you can actually start implementing and putting into, you know, into play for yourself and in your life that will make a change. So. You know, I really hope you found this to be helpful. Um, take these tips, start building your mental toughness muscle. Uh, the more you work at it, the stronger it becomes. That's the beauty about this. And uh, I want to remind everybody, you know, we're going to be live next Tuesday at 1 p.m. So, you know, I can't wait to see you. And uh, until then, stay healthy and keep moving forward.